to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Vasco Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Case, we will be sitting down with our industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Krishna Kumar Iyer, aka KK. KK comes with 30 plus years of deep IT experience across India, USA, Australia and Singapore. He has worked with leading world-class organizations like IBM, PricewaterCoopers, Siemens, and Mastec. KK has performed in a wide range of roles from large client account management, consulting, technology, lead transformation, pre-sales organization process, and more. KK has, has led many large ERP, enterprise resource planning and outsourcing deals. KK was a past member of APMP International Board, and KK is a certified practitioner level and, is also, and was also a contributing author to APMP's Body of Knowledge and the APMP Journal. KK is continuing his association with APMP as the Director General of APMP India Chapter. KK, welcome to Scribble Talk. Great to have you with us. Hey, thank you, Pascal. Really appreciate this. And thank you, Ashley, for having me. Perfect. Thank you, KK. KK, let's start from the very beginning. Where were you born? And let's talk about your high school and education. Right. Um, so uh, I was born down south, really deep down south, which is where my parents hailed from. And uh, typical of those days, um, when when your mother is ready to keep birth, she typically goes back to her parents' home because that, the, the support infrastructure there is usually the best. And that's where I was born in a, a place called Shankaran Kobel, which is just about, I would say, 70 kilometers north of the southernmost part of India. Mm. So that's where I come from. Uh, that's where I was born from. Rather, my parents came from that area, but I've never lived there and uh, uh, moved to the western part of India. Uh, since that time. And uh, yep, so there you go. Perfect. Sankaran Koil is in Tamil Nadu, right? That's correct. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, good, good. I, I'm from Coimbatore, Absolutely. as you know. So uh, uh, that's good. I think. Yes, I, of I, course. I grew up in uh, in Tutukuri. In Tutukuri. Uh, okay, yes. Seven years. So I've heard this name, but I've never been to. That's great. And from and from Sankaran Koyal, you did your uh, you did your uh, education there, high school education. Then where did you go for your higher studies, uh, for the colleges? Kate? No, so I was only born in Sankaran Koyal. My mm. uh, parents were already living in the western part of India in Gujarat in a city called Rajkot. Oh, nice. So all, all my studies, primary education, secondary uh, pri- uh, primary education happened in a city called Rajkot, and mm. then my uh, secondary school education. Uh, university up to masters all happened in a place called Ahmedabad. Wow. So, um, actually, for your information, um, India has what about uh, twenty-four official languages and about close to one hundred and fifty dialects. So, Tamil uh, Tamil Nadu, which which is the southernmost state, the people there speak Tamil, and the western part of India, Gujarat, the people speak Gujarati, and these two languages are as different as. Maybe as as different as Italian and and and, and Polish or or, or what, mm, something wow. as different as that. Yes, script is different. The grammar is different. Um, the nuances are very different. So there you go. Perfect. And from Rajkot, um, that's where you did your uh, uh, studies, is it? Yes, my early education was in Rajkot up to uh, up to my seventh grade, and then we moved to Ahmedabad where mm-hmm. Ahmedabad had much better colleges and universities and typical of Southern Indian families, as you know, Bhaskar, the mm-hmm. emphasis on education uh, being very high. Um, so uh, typically families gravitate towards, you know, good um, uh, university cities or towns and, and so that they can offer best opportunities to their children. So that's how we moved to Ahmedabad. Yes. Perfect. And from Ahmedabad, uh, what was your very first job? Yeah. So from Ahmedabad, I once I finished my master's in physics, uh, um, clearly that was a time when the entire IT boom was happening in India. Mm-hmm. And I happened to uh, land up on my first job uh, in Mumbai with a company called Mastec. Mm-hmm. And Mastec, interestingly, was developing some absolutely fantastic software, especially for companies, um, you know, uh, who wanted to computerize their accounts and all of those. So did a lot of work around that, especially the the first five years of my career with, with Mastec. 
um, was exceptionally good for me because it, it laid the foundation to not only develop a very impactful software, but it also helped me think in terms of uh, how I can add value to my clients. And that I think was, was uh, tremendously uh, um, enriching. And how long were you there at Mastec before you moved to other companies? Yes. So I was with Mastec for about uh, a bit more than five years uh, based out of Mumbai. And uh, uh, typical of those times, which is the late 80s, uh, the move towards uh, going for opportunities outside of India was quite high. And what Mastic did was wanting to set up an operation in Singapore. I was one of, I was one of the first people to move to Singapore to set up Mastic's operation in Singapore. So um, we went and set up the offers, um, uh, started uh, pursuing opportunities in the insurance uh, sector, which is where Mastic wanted to focus. So I was with Mastic in Singapore for about a couple of years. And after that, I said, okay, I think I need to change the perspective. And that's where I decided to leave Mastic and join uh, Siemens um, in Singapore. And uh, so that, uh, that, that was quite an interesting um, uh, assignment because I uh, took up a job to uh, deliver a significant project for the government of Singapore. And till date, arguably, I think uh, if there is um, any uh, demanding client, the most demanding client in the world, according to me, is still the government of Singapore. I don't think there's any client out there who can beat them in the kind of demands they make on vendors and service providers. So that was a, um, uh, how should I put it, uh, a life transforming uh, experience, let's put it that way. That's nice. So how was the journey from moving from India to Ahmedabad, to, uh, sorry, India to uh, Singapore? Singapore. Uh, did yeah. you take your family with you or uh, uh, how was No, the... no, I didn't. Okay. I didn't. I, I uh, got my family much later. Right. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, typical of uh, those days, I think it was more about just trying to get a sense of who you are, what you are, what are you trying to build and, and things of those nature. So um, uh, once that kind of started becoming clearer and I think uh, a sense came in saying that, yeah, maybe Singapore is not a bad place uh, to make it home. That's when I decided to, you know, get my family over and um, uh, started, bought an apartment, started settling down in Singapore. Uh, and Singapore, I, to its credit, I must say, um, uh, has done a phenomenal job in making it so easy for immigrants to settle down so much more easier, you know, right from housing to transport to, uh, you name it, very safe, as you know. And so everything was in place to make Singapore home and I made Singapore home for what the next nine years. Nice. From Mastec to Siemens to yes. Siemens to PricewaterCoopers to IBM. Please do talk us through your career sure. timeline. Yes. So I think this was this was the mid-90s, and I think uh, uh, we the IT industry created this uh, major um, how do I put it, demon amongst uh, all organizations that Y2K is going to destroy the whole world. And uh, we created the Y2K problem and we also created the demon around the Y2K problem in the minds of CIOs out there. So this was the time when SAP as the ERP software was taking off. And I was very excited with that whole um, uh, space in which uh, things were developing. And uh, IBM was looking for project managers to come and uh, be part of that SAP practice. And uh, IBM in those days was transforming itself from a very hardware-oriented company to a very services-oriented company. And um, so they were looking for project managers, and I got the opportunity, and that's how I jumped, uh, uh, jumped ship from Siemens and joined IBM. Um, I was thinking IBM would probably be an organization that I'll kind of um, uh, stick around with uh, sometime, but uh, uh, unfortunately... I decided to move on within about less than two years, uh, noticing the fact that the culture and, and uh, the things that worked around in IBM not necessarily suited me. I mean, no doubt it's a great company, but I was not particularly enthralled by it. And uh, so moved from IBM to PricewaterhouseCoopers. And that I thought was a very fascinating journey because uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers was completely and only into consulting. And, and SAP Consulting, of course, was a very large uh, part of it. So I still remember um, joining PwC and from day one onwards, my partner put me on to a proposal for uh, a large uh, opportunity that uh, PwC was pursuing. 
In those days, it must have been at least about close to $50 million, quite a large sum in, in 96, 97 types. And I had no clue about PwC. I didn't know anything about it. I just had to put up, put the entire proposal together. And my boss wasn't even willing to look at it. And, and I was getting very nervous about the whole thing because I'm here a newbie. And, and imagine for a moment, the presentation is on Friday and I'm putting that entire proposal up until Thursday. My boss hasn't even looked at it till, till I just took the uh, trouble to walk into his room and said, hey, James, his, his name was James Gordon. I said, James, this is, a, this is a $50 million proposal and you haven't even spent 50 minutes on this proposal. How are we going to win this? And, and of course, he's smiling. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And mind blowing. I mean, the way he, he convinced a client to go with PwC was exceptional. So huge learning. So yeah, so PwC was the continuation of the um, SAP journey. And uh, uh, so that kind of continued for uh, roughly, I would say about the next, uh, what, four years. Uh, and uh, by about 1999, um, the entire SAP practice for PwC in Australia was booming. And uh, uh, they wanted me to move to Australia as part of their international assignment. And uh, I jumped on the opportunity because uh, Australia as a country always fascinated me uh, simply because one, of course, the cricket part of it. Um, uh, so, so, so as a sport, I'm, I was a great follower of cricket. I played a lot of cricket. So I always wanted to kind of visit Australia from a cricketing uh, experience standpoint. And, um, and of course, the general beauty of the, of the country and all of those, I straight away jumped on that opportunity. And so we moved as a family to uh, Australia in, um, uh, I would say, uh, August 1999. And um, was there with PwC for the next... Uh, five years. Uh, so that journey was, was fantastic. I think the kind of work that I got to, got to do, the, um, the ability to sort of, uh, you know, travel around Australia, see different places, soak in the culture, um, everything. I, I think that was some of the best experiences that I've had, uh, uh, both from a work standpoint, as well as from a personal standpoint. Wow. Well, that's amazing. I think taking a young family around and uh, while you progress to your career, your family also enjoy the culture and the different aspects of uh, the different yes, countries. Yes. That's great. That's great. I, you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you brought that point up that while uh, when we moved to Australia, we literally didn't know a soul. We literally didn't know anybody other than a couple of people from uh, as office colleagues. And yet going in there, settling in, making friends, uh, was it was a tremendous learning experience, and I think I'm I'm a very strong believer that people should always travel. People should travel, migrate to other places because when you migrate to other places, you are the only thing that you carry with you is what I call as as your abilities, your hard work, and your attitude. You really don't have anything else. Those are the only resources that you carry, and therefore you 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 tend to become a little more open. You tend to become a little more um, how, how should I say, ready to get influenced by other perspectives, other views, other ways of life. And I think it just enriches you. And I, so for me, that move to Australia was definitely uh, uh, very fulfilling, I must say. That. Brilliant. And how long were you there in Australia? And was there, is where you worked for IBM or you switched back to another country, another job? <laughs> Okay. Yes, I, I was. I moved through Price for a House Coopers from Singapore to Australia, yeah. and uh, this was the time when there were huge challenges with many of these consulting firms, uh, mm. especially with the Enron failure and you know uh, WorldCom uh, companies failure and all of those. So consulting companies like PwC were split, and uh, guess what? IBM came back and and took over the management consulting of PwC. So I ended up back with IBM. And this was also the time when uh, this was, uh, I think, about uh, late 2002, early 2003, when, um, you know, me and my wife, uh, we started uh, looking at saying, hey, you know, should we consider moving back to India um, and uh, see how that goes? Because by then our son was, uh, you know, what, uh, he would have been about roughly seven years old. He said, this might not be a bad time to look at India. India is booming. A lot of things happening. Why don't we give India a shot and see how it goes? 
So roughly about end of 2002, early 2003, the bug to sort of, um, uh, if I may say, go back home, um, India being the natural home for, for all of us, it started kind of um, uh, taking its effect. And by about um, mid, mid to late August 2003, I decided uh, that we will sort of move back, back to India. And that's how I moved back to my old company, uh, Mastec, and um, had a very good relationship with them. Uh, I knew the, the CEO, the directors, and all of those. So it worked out very nicely. And, and um, they offered me uh, a role to head pre-sales. And up until then, my involvement with proposals was very sporadic. You know, off and on, I would get involved in proposals, but never as a, a leader of a function. So this was a very new um, sort of opportunity. So both the fact that I'm relocating back home and the opportunity to head a large pre-sales function uh, was quite exciting. And, and I think that, that pretty much convinced me that, uh, 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 you know, moving back home is, uh, um, is not a bad idea let's put it that way so late 2003 we moved back uh, to india uh, moved back moved away from australia a lot of people asked me why are you doing this? a lot of our indian friends in australia used to say hey we have been here in australia for the last what 10 15 years and we keep kind of vacillating between this thought of going back to india or staying here going back to india staying here but you guys have made this decision it's a very brave decision well so we'll we'll, we'll find out you know so, yeah, but um, I've never regretted it. I think uh, uh, Australia, uh, uh, the five years was fantastic, but equally moving back turned out to be uh, positive. Uh, as a great positive experience. So, great. yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so, so when I moved back, I think, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, I moved back to Mastec. So I had a pre-sales team with about 25 people. And our job was to look after the entire sales uh, support and uh, sales enablement proposals, everything, any support that sales needed was to be delivered by our function. So it was quite a, quite a transformative journey, both personally as well as for the organization. And I think for the first six months, um, I had major fights with sales and all I used, used to get was abuses from sales because I do, used to do a lot of um, disqualification of opportunities. And as you guys know, that that's the worst thing that he can do for any opportunity that sales brings to the organization. So I was really the bad boy for the first six months as far as sales was concerned. I was the villain in, in the entire piece. But I think uh, uh, we put some right things in place on, 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 on hindsight. I'm glad I, I stayed the course and not gave up in spite of fairly difficult uh, times and all of those. And sales over a period of time saw through uh, what we were attempting to do. And I think credit to them, the fact that they, um, uh, while they gave me a hard time, subsequently they were open enough to see what we were attempting to do. And then of course the relationship really blossomed into something uh, very, very nice. And I think uh, things became really good after that. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. From running proposals to running a proposal function, that was a journey in itself, setting up yes. a proposal function. Um, so what would you name as one of the most memorable proposal effort? Oh, yeah. So this was a proposal effort that we were doing for um, a large credit rating company in the U.S. They had floated a large RFP, outsourcing RFP. And the value of the deal was uh, something like $250 million dollars. Uh, which was quite a big ask as far as a company like uh, Mastic is concerned. And um, so uh, I had my sort of limited team working on it. And um, I thought that the, the team can pretty much run with it. And maybe uh, we had roughly, what, about four weeks uh, to go from receipt of RFP to submission of proposal. And it took me roughly about 10 days to realize that um, everybody in the team was clueless. So I immediately had to walk into my CEO's room and said, look, I need to create a war room for this. I need at least about 12 people that I can think of who needs to participate in this proposal effort, right from the, the solution architect, the pricing guy, to uh, the process guy, to people from HR, to uh, the technology specialist, technical architect, um, uh, um, you know, people who come from the transition part of uh, outsourcing deals. I know I need all these people. And we literally created a war room of, I would say, roughly about 15 people. 
and we were parked in the war room literally for about i would say 9 days continuous you know on, on most days working till god knows what you know, 12 midnight 1 am 2 am uh, so it was quite a demanding uh, proposal effort because it was quite new for the organization it was quite new for me as well you know even though i was the leader of the pack so to speak but such a large proposal effort was not something which i had ever attempted before so in that sense i was not only the leader but i was also learning as i was leading so that i think was was quite a um, demand on me but uh, i must say that it 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 added a lot of value to me in terms of the way i looked at proposals and and how to lead a team like this and how to lead a team of peers of our how to lead a team of people who are significantly senior to you in in terms of their knowledge or domain expertise and all of those and typically also come with big fat egos as as i'm sure you would have experienced as well so working with that sort of a very diverse team was quite a learning and enriching uh, experience i must say and literally working with the ceo to craft the entire executive summary because the ceo also wanted to kind of um participate in this very significant effort and he realized that unless he participated uh you know to to bring out the the key value proposition the executive summary may not fly through and i was still uh, even though i was rejoining the company but i was still sort of new to all the new new stuff that the company had got into and all of those so the ceo and myself we literally sat together till 1 am in the morning put together the executive summary rest of the proposal was already in place and sent it across to our folks in atlanta for them to go to fedex kinkos print out the entire proposal and submit it by i think something like 1 pm or 3 pm in 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 the afternoon uh, in the us so um very memorable uh, very demanding very stressful uh, but i guess these are the things that i suppose are the are the best learning moments so yeah quite uh, quite transformative perfect so at what point in your career did you come across apmp as an industry body oh apmp so what happened was that um uh, since heading that function you know i had the opportunity to go to the us work with mastech for 3 years and then decided to set up my own company and i think what happened was somewhere that entire experience of running the pre sales function stayed in my mind and i said you know it looks like putting together a proposal is quite a painful effort but yet we can bring in a lot of predictability to the whole thing so that thought always stayed in my mind and um, although i couldn't translate it into a real business proposition but once i decided that i will become an entrepreneur uh, sometime in late 2000 2008 what happened was we started doing a lot of training on bid and proposal management for some of the companies uh, based out of india and soon enough we realized that there are many companies who are facing the same thing here in india and we said why not carve this into a business service through training consulting proposal services mm. and uh, once we were in that journey then the thought occurred that hey hang on a second i'm what i'm doing here is not something which is new i'm sure other companies are submitting proposals so chances are high that there must be some kind of an association who must be sort of bringing this entire community together and that's where once i you know googled it and apmp came on board i said oh okay so this is bang uh, bang on as far as what we are doing and maybe we can find some synergy so i would say roughly about 2013 2014 is when i kind of uh, came to know about apmp and then of course i immediately became a member and uh, soon enough apmp um, announced the rolling out of uh, its uh, body of knowledge so i said hey maybe i can contribute uh, to this as well so i participated in uh, writing a ch- chapter on uh, the lessons learned uh, analysis and all of those as part of bok and then the relationship started growing and i said okay let me also get certification so i got my foundation certification and soon enough i said well let me get practitioner certification as well and yeah and then of course the partnership really took off so so 2013 2014 was when my first um relationship with apap happened brilliant and from associating to the industry body is one thing becoming a member as you know there are close to 11000 members now but not everyone take that extreme step of going and contributing back to the industry body which you have done consistently kk you have contributed to becoming uh, as an author to the apmp body of knowledge 
then you also contributed to the APMP journal, let alone then come back and uh, rejuvenate the APMP India chapter. Can you share some of your memories? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the drive to con contribute is, uh, how do I put it? It's, it's not necessarily uh, something that you uh, have when you're trying to make your career in your 20s and 30s. I, I, think, I think, or at least that's my personal experience. So I think the drive to contribute starts coming in in my opinion, when, when you reach a certain level of, I, I guess, maturity or, or when you start looking at the wider world in a little more, um, with a little more open mind. So I think the, the drive to contribute started coming in from that standpoint, really. And, and, I, and I think um, I felt that maybe I have something to contribute given the kind of experience that, that I've had. And when I looked at APMP and, and all of those, I felt that contributing to the body of knowledge, writing articles for the APMP journal uh, started coming into play. And somewhere, um, the when I looked at APMP and I said, hey, what is the bid and proposal community up to in India? You know, we have no idea about it. And maybe uh, look at other associations also as an example and see what they are doing. I mean, classic being PMI, the Project Management Institute, who has been very successful in India. And I think... Uh, um, so when I started looking at them, I sort of drew some parallels there. And I said that, you know, maybe it's not a bad idea to try and bring the bid and proposal community together using APMP as a platform so that, you know, the community can benefit in, gen uh, in general. Because when I participated in my first proposal, obviously nobody gave me any training. And I don't think there was anybody out there who knew anything about how to put together proposals in a very... Uh, methodical structured approach. It was all either heroics or um, everybody had their own opinion and probably the loudest voice won in terms of the way the proposals got uh, put together. And soon the realization came that that does not make sense. I mean, that's something which you can't keep repeating again and again, or, or it's extremely painful. So uh, looking at APMP and, and trying to therefore bring it to the benefit of the parent proposal com community uh, was really the, um, I would say, uh, driver behind, you know, uh, my uh, contributing uh, towards APMP and the community. So when the board applications uh, opened up uh, for the international board, my pitch to uh, APMP International was to say that, hey, I think there's a very strong community of bid and proposal professionals in India. Of course, we didn't have data. So I just took a guess that it's anywhere between 30 to 40,000 much later on, I came to know it's actually 70 to 80,000. So it's, it's a pretty large population. So I said, here's an opportunity which APMP International should seriously consider. In fact, it, it was in 2015 when I attended the BPC in Seattle when I met Rick Harris. And I was telling him that, hey, you, you guys should look at APMP India seriously. And um, probably when Rick was not very convinced with, uh, with that whole uh, story because I didn't get the vibes from Rick, Rick to say that, hey, we should now look at India seriously. And uh, of course, I went back home, did a bit more homework. And then, of course, when the board positions open, I, in my petition, I talked about why APMP International should consider uh, India far more seriously. And uh, um, uh, luckily, APMP International saw the merits of my uh, petition and uh, accepted me on the board. And then, of course, the journey to set up APMP India started becoming far more formal in that sense. And uh, during the uh, BP, BPC Orleans, uh, New Orleans, uh, BPC, I put together a very formal business case of, you know, um, uh, what's, the, what, what's the opportunity out there, why APAP should be present in India, what I think should be the investment that APAP should look at in terms of, uh, uh, if, uh, uh, in, in terms of India, and what are some of the things that, um, you know, the community will benefit, APMP will benefit, and overall, you're creating a a much better ecosystem. I mean, that's how I look at associations anyway. And um, uh, so I got a complete endorsement. I mean, there was total consensus in the board and said, yep, go ahead and do it. And well, we, our formal journey of APP India started in what, um, April 2018. We also got Rupesh on board. We hired Rupesh to come on board. He came from a strong association background with uh, CII, which is the Confederation of Indian Industry, another association. So we brought Rupesh on board and uh, yeah, since then it's been um, a fantastic journey. I must say that. I think, uh, um, I don't know about my contribution part, but I can certainly say that there's a whole lot of things that I have learned. And, and I, I, I think 
that's the only thing that I have under my control, which is what is it that I'm learning out of the whole thing. My contribution, whether it happens, it gets uh, contributes to something meaningful, is left for the world to decide. I, 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 I don't want to make too many comments on that. But yeah, that's the way I've looked at it. And I think I've attended multiple BPCs and uh, met you, Baskar, for example. And I think it's, it's just opened up new vistas. It, it's opened up new ways of looking at our profession. It's opened up new ways in which Mind IT, the firm which I'm running, uh, we are delivering services. It's also helped me look at APMP Farmer objectively and say, where do I see APMP strengths and where does APMP still um, lack in some areas, for example? So it allows me to look at um, things in hopefully a, uh, hopefully a lot more objective way, if not anything else. Yeah. It's just totally, totally, uh, you know, uh, understandable because, you know, it's so easy to take something that's already existing and uh, take it further. But in this case, APMP is still very much a pro-US body. And for us to take that message, translate in a language that we can understand at the very early part of the conversation, you mentioned how Gujarat and Tamil are different. Imagine landing that US message in UK, in, in India, and then convincing the entire India to accept this message, which is, it's pretty much writing a loan constitution of India. <laughs> in, 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 in there, it's, it's, it's not an easy job and whatever the foundations that you have laid, I'm sure will benefit the generations forward. And I, on behalf of everyone, please do accept my sincere congratulations on that. You know what, we, we can always improve, KK, as you always said, but know what, somebody needs to lay the path and you have done this and uh, with, with, uh, with the Naval board now doing this, it's great to hear positive stories coming there. You talked about APMP, you talked about the um, some of the conferences you attended and also from when you started to now, uh, how, what, uh, how many people have you got in APMP India chapter, any upcoming plans for? So we, when we formally launched APMP India in about April 2018, we were about 175 members. And today we are, uh, I just got the latest report up until 30th of November, we are 517 members. So um, the growth has been um, uh, really good. It's fantastic. I can't uh, complain about it. Um, but you can also look at it in, 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 in two ways. One, the growth has been good. When I look at the market opportunity, when you're having a market of what, uh, anywhere ranging from 60,000 to 90,000, we still have a long way to go. Let me put it that way. And I think um, the way I see it is we originally started with three board members. Now we are a board, we are um, uh, 11 board members. So it's just, um, we have been able to bring in a whole variety of people into, uh, into the mix. And I think that's, uh, um, setting in the foundation and the seeds for the future. So I think that's something which has certainly uh, made a huge difference. The, uh, I must also give credit to APMP International that they have gone all out to support APMP India through the pricing for membership, through the pricing for certification, I think has made a huge difference to um, APMP India. And, and I must thank uh, Rick and his leadership uh, to make that happen. So I think we've got the full, fullest support of APMP International and yet the complete creative freedom to do what we think we want to do in APMP uh, India. And I think that's, that's something which is really fantastic. Going forward, what is it that we want to be able to do? I think there are a few things that we, we, have, uh, we have been wanting to do. One, of course, we want to be able to have a world-class um, um, Britain Proposal Conference in India every year. We pulled off a really fantastic one in Feb of 2019. You were there, Bhaskar, and, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the contribution that you made to, to that conference, to the success of that conference. Unfortunately, with COVID, we are still a little uncertain about uh, 2021, but we want to be able to deliver a conference every year, which is really top-notch, really world-class. So that's clearly one thing that we want to do. We want to be able to expand the ecosystem of um, APMP India. So one of the things that we have just about uh, to complete is to make bid and proposal professionals out of um, B school students as well as engineering school students. So to us, B school students are ideal candidates to 
um, get them on board to become bid, successful bid and proposal professionals simply because they have the communication abilities, they are uh, strong in understanding of business, they're analytical in mind, ideal, uh, uh, if I may say, ingredients to uh, make successful bid and proposal professionals. And I think we want to be able to do that. Um, the other thing that we want to be able to uh, get into more uh, would be to start becoming more influential in the way, for example, uh, government issues RFPs. I think there's a huge opportunity for us to play a role there to say, hey, how can you structure your RFPs such that you get the best responses from vendors? Um, so one way of looking at it is located from a procurement standpoint. Another way of looking at it is looking at it from a vendor standpoint. Um, we have we are we have not even born there as far as that that initiative is concerned. But that's certainly a desire because I think APMP has a good role to play there, in my opinion. The other areas that we do want to get in in is to be the voice of the profession, and in in the sense to talk about. You know, if you, for example, if, you know, I'm, I'm just putting myself uh, in my shoes of 2003, when I had to set up the pre-sales function, everything I had to just invent based on my own way of looking at the world. If at that point in time, I was either aware of APMP or if APMP had enough data to support me on how to go about setting up a complete pre-sales function, what are the metrics I can use? You know, what are some of the best practices that I can use? That would have been extremely useful. So if we can put together... Um, uh, thought papers or, or very good research reports uh, around that, uh, you know, on, on how an ideal BD function, business development function should, should set itself up, work towards and keep measuring itself in terms of the value it is delivering for the organization. I think APMP, in my opinion, would be doing a tremendous job. So I think we have, we have lots of ideas to sort of uh, bring it forward. The other one, of course, is that we want to be able to uh, have local chapters in each city. So even though at the moment, everybody calls APNP India as a chapter, I don't see it that way. For us, the real chapters will be when I have a chapter in AP, in Pune, I have a chapter in Mumbai, I have a chapter in New Delhi, each having its own local thriving bid and proposal community, you know, talking about the issues local, locally around the kind of industries and organizations that are present around there. That to me is when I think APNP India as a, as a, as a, how do I put it? Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think of the, the umbrella body, so to speak. Uh, you know, APMP India as an un umbrella body would have uh, done its job well is the way I look at it. So yeah, there are plenty of things that I think we can do. Um, but um, yes, I think uh, as, as we go along that the journey will, will of course take its own twists and turns and all of those, I'm sure. Other people will bring in their own ideas. So that will shape things in a, in, in some other forms and shapes and all those. But yeah, it's definitely looking very exciting. I think uh, you, we always need to have a vision and a sense of direction where we are going. Looks like we do have that. It's about tactically uh, how long it's going to take us to reach there. Um, KK, that's it. But uh, so that's it from me. I think just to seed up to uh, Ashley, uh, tell us three things not many people know about you. Uh, <laughs> not know about me. So, well, interestingly, um, uh, when I returned back from the US, this was in 2007, I kind of was wondering what to do and, and stuff like that at that point in time. And I happened to join up with a bunch of guys uh, here in Pune and we set up a next generation or new generation political party, believe it or not. I mean, you know, Basker, as, as typically conservative middle class Tamilians, we don't get into politics and, and that side of the world. But I got into it because I just found it very fascinating. And I think um, it opened up a whole new bunch of perspectives. It, it brought in uh, interactions with a whole different set of people, a class of people. And I think, to me, that was really fascinating. And I think um, I even had the opportunity to uh, sort of uh, participate in uh, election in campaigning uh, in the 2009 Lok Sabha election. So it was... Quite, quite a fascinating journey. Uh, so that, that's one thing which I'm not sure many people know about it because we, we attempted that experiment. I don't think we, we were particularly successful uh, in that sense. But uh, from a personal standpoint, I think it was a totally fascinating journey. I mean, in spite of the fact that I was given very um, um, 
questionable looks from my family and extended family but i will i will never uh, sort of um, if i have to relive that experience i would more than happily do that uh, all over all over again so that i think is uh, is one thing which i don't know people know much about um well the other things are i'm not sure some people do know i'm i'm a yoga enthusiast i do a lot of yoga I try to keep myself fit and sane and and um, um, as balanced as i possibly can and i think yoga has done a, a tremendous job for me in that sense i wouldn't ever want to give it up uh so it's been a major uh, transformation uh what else i mean i'm, I'm that way very straightforward guy basker i'm not sure <laughs> that i've got too many my life is a, in that sense a fairly open book i don't have really too many uh, things that people might not know about me i mean of course i have other interests in in i do play golf i do painting i like cooking i i i do a lot of trekking around pune pune is a major um uh, place and has close to about 300 forts around the place which you can go and trek or on a, on a weekend go in the morning come back in the evening so those are things that my wife and i do um weather permitting and, and all of those so yeah so that's that's about uh, what i do to keep myself busy and occupied and and sane in sometimes this mad world i suppose that's a, that's a nice balance politics uh, some yoga some trekking some cooking i'll i leave ashley to dwell on that plus few questions around that but thank you i'll come back to you at some point kk <laughs> sure All right. Oh my gosh, it's been so amazing hearing about the different things you've done and your involvement in a- APMP India. Um uh, but let's dig a little bit into the more personal side. Uh you mentioned, you know, some hobbies and interests. Um I understand um also that you like to paint. Is yes. Is that true? Yes. yes. So what what do you like to paint? What kind of paint do you like to use? Can you tell us a little bit about that hobby? I I I I I'm, I'm still a novice painter uh, the whole whole <laughs> drive to paint came from the fact that in in my school I was a disaster when it came to drawing and painting and somewhere <laughs> I I guess that that stayed with me and, and and I felt that I needed to do something about it so that's where it really came from uh but yeah I I really I, I mean I paint anything that kind of uh, catches my eye I I don't I'm not um particularly I can't say I'm, I'm a particular type of painter and um so uh, i i i do it for my own own personal sake i'm i'm not here to create any exhibitions or go and um uh, give it to sotheby's to do auction my painting or none of those <laughs> drive or uh, uh, aspirations are there i paint for my own enjoyment and and i think it just relaxes me so i'm not uh, i do like to paint animals if there is any any preference yes i like mm-hmm. that. i i just find that so much more fascinating i attempted portraits uh, portraits and and uh, so far it's turned out to be a disaster but <laughs> that's okay i mean i i yeah. have no problem giving giving it some more attempts as well for sure yeah absolutely it's for your own enjoyment so yeah. which animal have you painted that you um enjoyed the most oh the one which i painted was a, a leopard cub and i think mm. moment i saw that um i said oh my god i wish i could paint this uh, and and so when i was working with my draw uh, painting uh, class teacher and and all of those she said yeah you can do it and then so she kind of guided me and i was quite fa- quite um uh, uh not to beat my uh, own drums but i was quite impressed with the final output so that's something which i'm very um sort of uh, fond of um other one which i'm right now working is on a on a uh, you know male deer with its antler and all of those mm. looking back at the camera so uh, it's work in progress um i can still see a lot of mistakes in it and try to fix those <laughs> but that's okay that's i i've just accepted that that you know that i'm going to struggle with it because i, I don't think i'm a natural painter i'm not the one who has talent on it but i'm willing to give it patience and oh it and, sounds and like a, such it. a great enjoy the struggle yeah. so to speak Yeah, it's a great hobby. I like to paint as well, but I too am a novice and I just mostly paint landscapes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, yes. Yeah, la- landscape uh, is far more meditative, I think. Mhm. Absolutely. Uh so you also like to cook. What is your favorite thing to cook? Well, I am the official bread maker in the home. 
So I, I have my, my wife has given me the task to make bread. Mm. So that's something which I have to do on a regular. As in when, it, when it gets over, I am given the task. Okay, bread is over. Time to make some more bread. So I, I do that. But besides that, I can pretty much, you know, um, cook most meals. When the wife is away um, visiting her parents, then she's she's usually away for a couple of weeks, and I'm I cook the full meal for myself. And I prefer to cook uh, cook at home, and 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 I enjoy the process. So Indian, Thai. uh italian uh some sweet dishes i can make some sweet dishes as well um i can make some brownies i can um, i'm not a big fan of cakes for some reason mm-hmm. so i don't usually make cakes yeah but um <laughs> i do have a sweet tooth so i i kind of want to make some sweet stuff um i mean i how, i don't know how how familiar you are with indian sweets but uh, if you visit an, any indian uh sweet shop uh, especially here in india you can just go crazy <laughs> with the sheer variety and uh, you know uh, you can walk in and and you can just go mad so somewhere i want to be able to attend each one of those at at home so that's one of the things that i want to do but yeah i think um, i find cooking very therapeutic oh wow it sounds like you have lots of ways to kind of meditate and wind down and you know keep sane in this crazy industry that we're in yes 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 <laughs> absolutely yes i better do that <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to switch over to our more rapid fire questions round. And so these are just quick responses. Don't think too much about the answer, no right or wrong. Um, how would you change your yeah, life sure. today if the average life expectancy was 400 years? Healthy? Become more healthy? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um if you had to be renamed after one of the planets in the solar system which would you pick Jupiter If you were the captain of a pirate ship what would you name your ship and what would your title be Introspection Ooh very nice and would you have a pirate name That's a good <laughs> That's a good that's a top one Pirate name uh, I don't know unbelievable something like that something crazy <laughs> yeah. like that i don't know i'm i'm, I'm just just, <laughs> just trying to try to think of um uh, a good one yeah something like that yeah very good introspective and unbelievable um what would win a fight between a rhinoceros and a hippopotamus yep yes i would say a rhinoceros mm, i think i agree <laughs> um yes. if you were stranded on a desert island what three items would you take with you Oh certainly my um uh, my paint paint brushes and paint if i can if i can mm-hmm. do that um maybe a knife so that okay I, i can hopefully cut something and 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 take care of myself um maybe my golf clubs oh or one gl- nice. or one golf club <laughs> or one, if i'm allowed <laughs> a bit of luxury and a few balls full golf balls maybe yes sounds great If you had to choose a completely new profession, what would you pick? I want to be a drummer. Hmm. So are you a musician? I am not. I'm musically <laughs> challenged actually. Seriously, <laughs> I uh, I'm one of those few people um uh who I have to remind myself that hey, I haven't listened to some music. Why don't I put on some music? I consider myself musically challenged. Mm. but i'm very fascinated by uh, drums and and when i watch good drummers i mean phil collins to me is probably the best one that i that comes to my mind or in india there's uh, there's one musician uh, one drummer called shivamani basket might be familiar with mm-hmm. him he's you know, absolutely fascinating mm, very cool would you prefer to live in the sahara or the antarctica antarctica If your 5-year-old self suddenly found themselves inhabiting your current body, what would your 5-year-old self do first? Hopefully he will admire my painting. <laughs> yeah, I bet he would. If it was especially if that was something I hope so. With. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that is the last question that I have and I think Basker is going to take over um with the gratitude round. Sure. thank you actually uh, so yes uh, kk so uh, who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career 
life certainly my mother i think uh, she she lived a life which simple honest straightforward um i think she instilled those values uh, in me and I'm, i'll always be grateful for that uh, as far as my career is concerned my first boss um, uh, unfortunately just passed away a couple of months ago and, and that to me was quite quite uh, this one he he used to use this adage he used to say that always happy but never satisfied so i've kind of adopted that into my own life to say mostly happy but never satisfied so um but as i said of course there were so many things that i kind of learned from him so i'm always be thankful and grateful to him for being that influence in my life what have you observed lately in this covid environment that reminded you that people are kind oh well i mean this is quite fascinating i i i i know through my political journey i happened to sort of meet up with uh, a retired vice admiral of the navy and and we have been of course he's much senior to me and um i've, I've had some great conversations with him you know about a whole lot of things unfortunately for him over the last 3 uh, years has been a bit tragic he lost his, his wife then during covid times in june he lost his son a very very successful entrepreneur um a son who was about 45 46 years old and yet i find this gentleman today working with cancer patients and supporting them in how to deal with it he works with the ayurveda naturopathy um person uh to support them in, in in making their best attempts to either cure them or at least give them a pain free life and all this during covid times mind you and and i think to me that was really an eye opener saying that you know here is a man who's gone through multiple tragedies in his own life if you look at the way he's kind of kept all of that aside and working for the benefit of somebody else and and he's a vice a retired vice admiral of the navy i mean you can't ask for a better sort of pedigree in terms of a career or a profession than that and here this is what he's doing i find that very fascinating totally totally and who is the kindest person you know i know or i knew i think it will still have to be my mother i'm i might be biased or whatever but yes i think she she had it built in her uh, she came from a family of uh, five sisters and uh, uh, kindness was was sort of deeply ingrained in that family and 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 that to me was uh, um you know uh, just came very naturally to them and i think something which i've always admired about her um but yeah i'll just help you a little bit here how would you describe your wife in one line um my wife is somebody who is comes with a very high integrity when i say high integrity um i just need to explain this a little bit high, i mean whatever she takes up she she takes it up with the fullest of sincerity fullest of passion um you may or may not agree with what she's doing and and that's perfectly all right but whatever she does she does it with the highest levels of integrity and that to me i find it very admirable quality in her totally totally so what's one thing you wish you had known when you began your career yeah that um that that there'll always be struggles in life and i think the fact is that um we are never taught how to deal with struggles but i think if i was just told if if somehow i was taught to enjoy struggles which i think i'm doing today And, and but it took me so many years to 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 kind of reach that state um i think that was certainly helped um you know you you're generally told that okay you know you do this and life will be completely transformed it'll all be heavenly and blissful and all it's it's never the case you just have to keep working continuously throughout your life and you'll keep you'll always be part of some struggle or the other the point here is that is there some way that we can be taught that you enjoy the struggle it took me many years to kind of get into that uh, uh, sort of uh, way of looking at things but if that's something which i was told early in my career or early in my life i think i would be very thankful great so what's the best piece of advice you have received and from whom 
Uh, this 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 is an interesting question because uh, I was doing this project uh, with one of my clients, and this was a senior VP of finance, and um, he was a very demanding kind of guy, but very fair, uh, you know, to his credit. And he one day made this uh, statement saying that only believe a person's yes when he can say a no. And um, as you know, Basker, sometimes in India we we tend to just say yes even though we are never sure whether we'll be able to deliver, but maybe sometimes we are a little afraid to say no. And I think that somehow stuck in, my, stuck in me to say that, uh, you know, whenever I'm promising something, am I really in the ability to, to deliver it? In which case I'll say yes. Otherwise I'm better off saying a no. And I think, you know, I, I, I find that when I'm interacting with people, if they say no, I find that they're likely to be far more believable. So that's, this is one great advice I have received it. I've tried my best to practice it as far as possible. Hopefully it's worked. Perfect. And what advice would you give someone who is looking to pursue a similar career like yours? Go for it. Just go for it. In, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, success or failure is really not in our hands. I think, I'm, I'm sure we all, you all know that. But the process is important. The, the, the journey is important. You know, the, the struggle and, uh, you know, um, if, you, if you can enjoy that struggle, I think those are things that will be, that will make you far more resilient as a person towards anything and everything that gets thrown at you as part of life. The good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it be the case. I think that's, that's probably the only thought that comes to my mind to that question. I think that's, that's so true these days with covid I think people who are stagnant are the people Indeed. who continue to be stagnant. Absolutely. Go for it. It's a very, very profound advice. Thank you, KK. And KK, we talked about your early life, career, uh, and your journey in different geographies, coming back, um, you know, working with APMP, setting up APMP in India, establishing APMP. Um, we talked about your hobbies, interests, painting, mother, wife, uh, COVID, everything. What's next for you? Pretty much the same thing. I'm not. I'm not uh, the type who set myself uh, five-year goals or or ten-year goals or things like that. I'm definitely not looking at it. If 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 I can, um, the way I look at it is that if I can continue to enjoy whatever I'm doing, I'll continue to do that. And to me, I'm in a I'm in a space and stage in my life where I think I, I, more or less have it there. So there's there's. Uh, um, how do I put it? Uh, that adage continues to remain mostly happy, but not satisfied. So they'll all, I'll always find something which is uh, not satisfactory and therefore I'll find something to work on it. But that's not going to make me unhappy. I think I'll, I'll, I'll stay reasonably happy. I, I can't guarantee I won't be unhappy during some time, but I think most of the times I'll stay happy. So that's the way I want to be able to uh, lead my life going forward. Stay healthy. Um, you know, uh, see if I can contribute to, um, in, in whatever way to people around me, uh, small contributions, big contributions, doesn't matter. And, and so far as I can stay true to that, I'm okay. Nice. So is there any part of your life or career or is there anything else you would like to share to our listeners, KK, before we close? Not really. I think I pretty much shared everything of, uh, if I may say, importance. Yeah, I think um, I, I, just, I just consider myself blessed. Blessed in, in everything that's happened, all the difficult times, the struggles, all of those. I'm, I, I, I'm very happy with, with my family. I have a great relationship with my wife, my son, my uh, extended family. I've got a great bunch of friends. Um, I can't think of other than one or two people who I wouldn't be able to get along with. I think I generally get along well with people. I don't have a problem with that. Um, yeah, uh, even though I might have some really serious arguments with people, but I would have no problem. Uh, I would have no malice towards anybody. So I'm, mm. I'm happy with the way life has turned out. I really, really am grateful. So I have nothing to complain about and I hope it just continues that way. 
That's brilliant. I think I wish it continues that way. Stay blessed, uh, KK. So wish you and your family and your loved ones and all of our APMP India colleagues and board members and everyone whom you're going to touch all the good health and happiness. Please to continue to inspire not just our community, but everybody, your politics, your drumming dream, your uh, arts, painting, you name it, everybody continue to inspire your community around you. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy. Thank you for joining Scribble Talk. Hey, my pleasure. My pleasure, Basket, really. I think, I think this was a wonderful conversation. Really appreciate it. And I think you guys are do doing a fantastic big job. Um, I like the kind of questions that were posed to get you thinking. I like the rapid fire around uh, Ashley. Um, but yeah, I think you guys are doing a tremendous job. Please continue to do so. I think this is a tremendous, I would say, a radio broadcast of our profession and community. And I think that's what you guys are effectively doing. So keep doing it. Thank you, KK. Thanks for all your love and support. For now, yeah. thank you again, and I'll speak to you very soon. Take care. Will do, Baskar. Thank you, Ashley. Really appreciate it. Thank you very right. much, guys. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Sundrum. Signing off. <laughs>